Good to be with you. I'm Francis Rivera in for Thomas Roberts and topping MSNBC live at this hour. A tale of two candidacies for the major party frontrunners. Donald Trump is back on top. We'll have more on that in a moment because Hillary Clinton has two major problems surfacing today. First, a new poll now has her behind Bernie Sanders. And second, her email controversy is back. After refusing Republican requests for months, she is turning over her private email server as well as a thumb drive with copies of those emails. Also, a government report finds that two of the emails already turned over contained information deemed top secret. That's a much higher standard of classification than previously known. A short time ago, my colleague Andrea Mitchell spoke with a congressman at the forefront of demanding Clinton turn over the server, Trey Gowdy. For 20 months, those emails were neither too burdensome nor too cumbersome. It was only when our committee began to ask the State Department for her emails that she said, you know what, it's been 20 months. Gosh, I really need to get rid of this stuff. I just don't think that passes the laugh test, but I haven't had a chance to ask her about it either. We are covering both candidates from several angles. NBC's Carrie Dan is following Clinton. MSNBC's Jane Tim is following Trump. And former Republican governor and presidential candidate Tim Pawlenty is here to give us an insider's view. So let's start with NBC News political editor Carrie Dan. Carrie, uh, to you, let's break this down here because there still is that confusion, uh, especially with the State Department saying that there's a question about whether these emails were classified okay. as top secret, even more so the timing of when they were sent out, uh, when they appeared in her account. So is that something that the Clinton camp can can use as as a kind of an excuse right now saying, hey, this is between the State Department and intelligence officials fighting, you know, their bureaucratic fight? That's right. The Clinton campaign has maintained that this is about a bureaucratic dispute between intelligence officials and the State Department, differing on how information should be classified, when it should be classified, and so on. But one thing I think is worth noting is that the uh, intelligence community, commu uh, community inspector general who reviewed these emails and found some of them that contained what he called as top secret information was only among, from among a very small sample of the actual emails. This isn't four emails out of the entire tranche of them. This is uh, four and then two with the top secret information from a much smaller sample. So I think the question that remains is, if more of those emails are looked over by the IG community, if they're going to find other instances uh, that, may, that may counter what the State Department has said thus far about still trying to figure out exactly what was classified and when. Okay, as her camp uh, goes into damage control mode after the release of this, let's consider what is more damaging uh, to Hillary Clinton right now, the fact that the email case or the way she's responded or lack responded uh, to the request of the server and then now finally, finally giving them up. Well, this has been about six months that she has resisted turning over the server and then this other additional thumb, thumb drive that has some of these emails on it. Look, either way, it looks, even if Clinton decided, okay, this is the moment that we're going to give it over, or if they decide they're just under too much pressure uh, from investigators from DOJ and the FBI, it looks, the optics of it kind of look as though she has been forced into it. This was sort of what a lot of observers thought was mm -hmm. going to happen about six months ago, that she was eventually, she was going to resist and resist and then eventually turn them over. Either way, it looks like she's kind of dragging her feet. Not a great day for the Clinton right. campaign well, on that respect. Certainly, it's kind of, you know, this whole email thing is kind of like a le leaky faucet, you know, or wrapping tape around it, drip, drip, drip. And uh, inevitably, you know, is, are th those, per those uh, pipes going to burst? Well, absolutely. And because this, the, there's these continuing debates, we see these headlines over and over. And this, the fact that this server is now out of her hands mm -hmm. and in the hands of inspectors means that I think we're going to continue seeing that drip, drip, drip uh, for, yeah. throughout the rest of the summer and beyond. And where it may be affecting our, our uh, Hillary Clinton's poll numbers, especially with uh, Bernie Sanders ahead of Clinton for the first time uh, by seven points. So how worried should she be? Well, that's right. This is one poll out of the swing or the primary state of New Hampshire with Bernie Sanders having surged into a first place position. And I think what's really worth noting about this is that when you look inside these numbers, only about 11 percent of Democratic primary voters in New Hampshire say they actually believe that Bernie Sanders is going to be the Democratic mm -hmm. nominee. Sixty five percent say they think it's going to be Hillary Clinton. So it's a little bit of a challenge for the, the Clinton campaign to look at these numbers. This is only one poll. It's a snapshot. But look at these numbers and say, what are these people who are support, supporting Bernie Sanders? What is the big issue that's drawing them that way, especially if they don't think that he's going to be a viable nominee or the nominee at all? NBC News political editor Carrie Dan, as always, thank you very much. Thank you. Donald Trump, meanwhile, is back in form. Last night, he wowed a crowd of Michigan Republicans with his usual talking points about immigration, as well as a few jabs at his fellow Republican candidates. And he also appeared on Fox News with a message for anyone offended by his repeated controversial remarks about women. Listen.
I think I'll do more for women. I cherish women. I think I'll do more for women than Hillary can ever do. MSNBC's Jane Tim covers Donald Trump, and now she joins me. So, uh, Jane, we want to bring up these two polls released yesterday out of New Hampshire and Iowa, both showing Trump still ahead in those states. So, uh, you know, based on that, I, I know there's some closing in, but has there been no damage to his brand? You know, it's. I think where you see the real story here is those candidates who are closing in, exactly as you said, Francis, where you see John Kasich in New Hampshire shooting up into double digits where he wasn't before. And that's, I mean, he just announced he was running a few weeks ago. So as Donald Trump continues to make controversies and headlines, People are looking for other candidates, and I think that's really important here. We also saw in Iowa people who watched the debate, who saw Donald Trump sort of sputter and yell at Megyn Kelly a little mm -hmm. bit. Scott Walker was tied with him. Those are big numbers this early in the race. He's still going to dominate for a few more weeks, but I think we're starting to see some cracks in the throne. And as we heard him say he cherishes women, he also said something kind of unusual for a Republican. He was praising Planned Parenthood. He said he's still against abortion. Uh, but he says there are some good that Planned Parenthood does. How unusual is it for a Republican frontrunner to say anything positive, positive about the organization? It's so unusual. I mean, it sounded like a red state Democrat, frankly, who's trying to sort of balance the, uh, the, the voting line. But Donald Trump's followers aren't really looking for policy proposals. They don't really want to see a white paper on how you handle Planned Parenthood. What they want to hear is the bombast and the, you know, truth to power. They want to hear him sort of speak his mind on everything. It doesn't totally matter. Matter what he says, it matters that they think that he's actually saying what he believes. That is what people like. It's that brand of I'm going to tell you exactly how it is and speak straight that really appeals to voters. All right, MSNBC's Jane Tim, thank you very much. I am joined now by former Minnesota Governor Tim Pawlenty. Uh, Governor, thank you for being with us and for your time here as we stay on topic with Donald Trump and all the things that he's gotten away with saying. Still being on top, can he get away with complimenting aspects of Planned Parenthood? <laughs> well, it looks like he can get away with almost anything, it seems. But keep in mind, he seems to be topping out at present around 20 or 25 percent. That means 75 to 80 percent of the Republican primary voters are supporting someone else. So it's important how and when this field attrits and gets redistributed back to remaining candidates. And when that happens, somebody who's stuck at, say, 20 percent probably isn't going to be the winner. Well, let's talk about that, what the Washington Post, uh, Dave Weigel, he was at last night's at GOP affair in Michigan and, and wrote this, and I want to hear your take. Uh, Trump's grassroots support is scattered, random, and real. Multiple attendees said that they had never previously gone to a political rally, much less a party fundraiser. And all of a sudden, here Donald Trump is rallying these people. So what is Donald Trump tapped into your party that the others can't even budge yet? Yet. And it's not just in the Republican Party. To some extent, Bernie Sanders is tapping into this in the Democratic Party. It's a couple of things. One is blunt talk, a sense of authenticity, the non-politician, somebody who's not the usual, you know, yappity, yappity, yappity politician. And uh, he's able to get away with that. And there is a market for that, for sure. And if you don't take it too far, it might even be a winning strategy. But I think for both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, they have enough baggage where if somebody else can consolidate the rest of the field, the non-Trump, non-Sanders vote, you know, that's a successful strategy. And it, and it depends on who drops and when and how those votes get consolidated. Mm -hmm. And how much policy is addressed in that time, too. I want to switch to another candidate, Jeb Bush. Uh, this is what he said about Hillary Clinton, or rocking foreign policy last night. ISIS grew while the United States disengaged from the Middle East and ignored the threat. And where was the Secretary of State? Where was Secretary of State Clinton in all of this? In all of her record-setting travels, she stopped by Iraq exactly once. All right, so we saw those swipes against Hillary Clinton and Iraq. But do you think people are going to buy that? Are they going to blame Hillary Clinton and, and the president for Iraq more than his brother? We, we've seen him you know, kind of distancing himself from his brother. But in this case... Well, I think uh, two things. One is, uh, as a small state governor, a state of a, you know, Minnesota, modest size, I was in Iraq uh, more than Hillary Clinton was. I was there five times during the war. Uh, but as to Jeb, a couple of things. One is, kudos to him for actually addressing an issue substantively, and regardless of whether you agree or disagree, we want candidates to do that, so tip of the cap for that. But two is, he's going to own this issue anyhow. 
and certainly how we got into Iraq is important, but what happened since President Obama became president matters too. And when he decided not to leave a residual force in Iraq, that had consequences. When he decided to not take action in Syria and allow an environment to be created where ISIS could thrive, that had consequences. And to the extent the mission right now by this president is dismantle and destroy ISIS, and that's not working, there, you need to change strategy. So I think what Jeb outlined last night, those were reasonable incremental steps to try to have a better, more effective strategy mm -hmm. in Iraq and Syria. And we'll see if it resonates uh, with the voters out there. Former Minnesota Governor Tim Pawlenty, uh, thank you so much for joining me. Appreciate your time. You're welcome. And now